Welcome to UCC's Global Speaker Series. This evening, we're joined by Vice Admiral Mark Mellet and Professor Ursula Kilkelly for a discussion on human security, climate challenges and migration. Vice Admiral Mark Mellet is the founder and director of Green Compass and former Chief of Staff of the Defence Forces. He has served Ireland for nearly 48 years and he currently specialises in the complexities of today's strategic environment. Mark is Chair of the Advisory Council of the Azure Forum on Contemporary Security Strategy. He holds a Doctorate in Political Science and a Master's in Government and Public Policy, specialising in Ocean Governance and Sustainable Development. Mark is an Adjunct Professor of Law at UCC and was the distinguished top graduate in each of his Senior Command and Staff courses at the US Naval War College the Irish Military College and the UK Royal, Nerf, Royal Naval College. He has a keen interest in research focused on technological innovation, climate change, offshore renewable energy, ecosystems governance, security and sustainability. Mark was co-founder of the Irish Maritime and Energy Resources Cluster, which received the Taoiseach's Award for Excellence in the Public Service in 2012. He's known for his leadership in the agile and flexible response of the Irish Defence Forces throughout the shock of the COVID-19 pandemic. Ursula Kilkelly is Professor of Law at University College Cork, where she is Head of the College of Business and Law. She was Dean of the School of Law from 2012 to 2019. She's a Charter Director with the Institute of Directors in Ireland. In addition to her leadership roles, Ursula is also an accomplished researcher in the area of human rights, specifically the rights of children, where she's widely cited internationally. Ursula has a strong interest in international relations and the role of global institutions in human rights. This evening, our speakers are going to discuss the role of diplomacy, leadership, governance, and international relations in promoting social justice. Welcome, Mark and Ursula. Thank you very much, Karen, for that kind introduction. And good evening, everyone. And we're delighted to have you with us. Can I welcome Mark to today's conversation? Mark, I couldn't think of anyone better to have this discussion with in our Global Speaker Series. And I'm really looking forward to the range of topics that we're going to cover together in our, in our conversation. To begin with, though, can I ask you to place this conversation in context, context maybe, in terms of your background, your professional career, how you came in contact with and to collaborate with UCC and ultimately to graduate from the university. Well, listen, thanks very much, Karen, for the introduction. And Ursula, it's great to chat with you. I suppose my relationship with UCC goes back, it goes back decades, actually. I, one of the first um, lecturers we had from UCC was Tony Lewis back in my early days as a young officer. And he used to lecture us on oceanography. Uh, Tony is the founder of the whole, uh, I suppose, drive in Ireland on uh, renewable energy, and he would be the ion of that. And it's really great to see that coming home as real strong government policy today, um, almost 40, 50 years after Tony started driving this uh, ahead on his own. And I think my relationship with Tony and the development of the Naval Service then led to a stronger relationship after I came back from the States in 1999. Um, I had a lecturer there, Professor Lawrence Judah, and um, Lawrence was really keen on the idea of integrated ocean management. And uh, I, I engaged then with a uh, University College Cork, and in particular Seamus Otuma in the School of Government. And um, he took me on for a master's in government and public policy. And my focus was on uh, integrated ocean management. And in the years that followed then that relationship blossomed further with um, a, a good colleague of ours, the late Barry McSweeney, um, John O'Halloran, now the current president, and Pat Fitzpatrick. And uh, around that time, we hatched a cunning plan, uh, which was centered on the Irish Maritime and Energy Resource Cluster. And one of the first uh, drivers of that was a a program for research in third level institutions uh, for the building of the Beaufort Laboratory alongside the National Maritime College. And I, 
I thought there was great leadership from UCC at that time in terms of seeking integration between the higher education institutes in the Cork region, where you bring that marriage of a centre of excellence like the National Maritime College and then put beside it a world-class research facility in terms of wave energy initially and subsequently with the Science Foundation Ireland um, MARI um, creation, a, an extraordinary cluster that began to blossom and is the centre of gravity, I think, in, our, in terms of Ireland's research in the whole area of renewable energy to this day. Mm -hmm. So th that's it. And finally, I, I think our own relationship burst in terms of the Masters in Maritime Law. Uh, that was something that was co-created, another cunning plan, uh, re really successful in the context of its utility and really um, very important for an island nation like Ireland to have that kind of research happening and that mastery of a subject in areas maritime. And, and I think there's many themes there that we're going to return to, not least the university's sustainability credentials and the, the role the university has played and is continuing to play in, uh, in, in research collaboration, but also, also reaching out to stakeholders important uh, nationally and internationally. So we will no doubt come back to those, those topics towards the end of our conversation. I want to turn though to some of the key themes, Mark, of your professional career, security, international relations, diplomacy, leadership, all of these topics we're hoping to cover uh, in, in some form, form throughout the course of our conversation. And I want to, I suppose, start with the most immediate and pressing concern of the international community and indeed of many of our alumni around the world, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, clearly um, unfolding before our eyes is, is um, a, a desperate um, situation and we can only imagine, I suppose, the final outcome um, but, but in your extensive experience, Mark, what can we learn uh, from the current crisis? And in particular, how the world has responded? Yeah, well, I think um, it's interesting. For the last six years, uh, up to my retirement, I sat with the, my peers on the, the EU military committee. And um, at that committee, you know, the issue of security of Europe was uh, obviously regularly on the agenda. But there was always a sense in terms of the extraordinary dividend that um, had been delivered by the construct of the EC and in the EU in terms of stability, notwithstanding the Balkan Wars. We've almost had 75 years of uh, peace in the Union. And, um, and, and I think, and I'll come back to the question on Ukraine, but the, the reason I, I go back that far in history is that the peace in Europe was not just built on the vision of the likes of Robert Schuman. It was built on other uh, institutional, I suppose, instruments, such as the Marshall Plan, a reconstruction in the post Second World War, 15 or 16 billion US dollars to rebuild the very countries that actually had triggered the, um, the First World or Second World War. And as well as that, then, was a, a continuation, I think, of interest from the US in the context of that transatlantic relationship with the European Union and the US. And um, what we began to see then a, a shift in the in the last decade or so, kind of the, I suppose, the, the unilateralism, uh, almost a populism in some cases, the uh, regression in the context of the Trump era. And you also saw, I suppose, in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union, that um, tension between NATO and Russia itself and the Russian Federation. I think in the case of NATO, there was obviously an expansion. I mean, at present, NATO has 30 members. Uh, prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union, it had 16 members. So 14 of those members have joined since the uh, Soviet Union collapsed. And, and then you had, on the other hand, the Russian response, uh, which was you know, the creeping annexation of uh, Georgia, you can see it today in Ossetia and um, in other regions. You saw the actual annexation of Crimea in 2014. And, and these tended to be associated with, um, I, I think, uh, activities which regards to NATO. I was in Warsaw for the NATO summit in 2017. And out of that came the idea of enhanced forward presence. And that was a distribution of NATO forces in the um, Baltic states in particular, and that was a uh, Canadian, French, uh, British forces going into the Baltic states uh, in many ways as tripwires for Article 5. So we, we were 
there was a change in the dynamic leading up to the point whereby the actual invasion took place. I, I think, you know, there's a general uh, acceptance that there is a, a staggering miscalculation by Putin. Mm. I, I don't think anybody anticipated that he would try and bite off all of Ukraine. And yet, at the same time, you know, if you were to try and look for rationality in it, perhaps it's it's based on the reality that there was a very tight circle of advisors. There was a, an echo chamber in terms of um, the the pre-war plans, and and also that would be built on the I, I suppose engagement of um, Russia in Syria, where it it to some degree had a free hand in its ability to act, while Western states found themselves really challenged in terms of intervention or no intervention. And in many ways, NATO was very much preoccupied with Afghanistan and yeah. the, the terrible tragedy we've seen there. So it, it is what it is, and you mm -hmm. had the invasion, and um, you know what's going to happen, we could, we could have the whole discussion on that. And and have we seen it? At, um, the is this the upshot of the disconnect though between trade uh, and security? You know where where we 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 believed that the trading with uh, with with uh, with the Russian Federation as a partner, uh, Germany is is I think a, a good example of this. Putting trust in the trade relationship to ensure good relations from a security point of view. Yeah, I, I, I do. I do think that it's very hard to look at security um, from the perspective of Russia. If you use the, the Western lens, it's the wrong lens. You're in trouble straight away. And I, I think that it's very difficult for us to understand uh, how important security is to uh, Russia. I was in Poland about three weeks ago and I, I visited a grave in Poznan, a, a war grave in Poznan, and there were about five or six hundred uh, British soldiers there and the poignant piece was the ages on the headstones 25, 27, 21 and I couldn't help but think that just five or six hundred kilometers mm -hmm. to the east of there a war was happening but the, the other piece that was actual to some degree um, made me reflect was just over the wall from that graveyard were 3,000 Russian soldiers who were buried and um, mm -hmm. they had huge casualties in the second world war in terms of their battle uh, against Nazism. And, and to some degree, that's the point that's interesting in the context of the discussion we have here. We've seen the change in strategy with regards to Putin. His, uh, I, I think there's no doubt he is trying to find a way in which he can seize a victory out of this. And the 9th of May is a critical date in mm -hmm. the context of the Russian diary. And I, yeah. I, I would see that's why there's a consolidation on the Eastern uh, Ukrainian a jurisdiction and that drive to try and enhance the actual uh, foothold, perhaps to try and uh, build that bridgehead everybody talks about down to uh, Crimea. Like mm -hmm. Crimea is connected with Russia by a very, by a very flimsy uh, line of communications, a single bridge, which is um, not sustainable in the context of, I suppose, security and the desire to actually build a bridgehead uh, through Luhansk and Donbass area down towards Crimea. I would say is the objective. Mm -hmm. The question is, will Russia be satisfied if it succeeds with that? Uh, that's one question. The second question, can Russia actually enhance the foothold it has? And um, e either in either question, we, we should be in no doubt there will be significant civilian casualties mm -hmm. in the context of the next phase. And I, I think it's with tragedy we're going to watch that unveil over the coming number of weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the end state on this it may well be a frozen conflict. The end state on this could actually be a tripwire to something larger. And um, uh, we can just, uh, I suppose, step back and watch. Um, yeah. Institutions, I think, have done their best. Uh, there is one more card to play in the context of energy. I do think the fact that there's a huge, um, um, I suppose, remuneration going to fuel this war in the context of Europe's dependency on uh, Russian LNG in particular, yeah. uh, it would seem to me that that has to be the next uh, decision in terms of sanctions. I, I, I recall um, an ambassador in one of uh, the European states saying, we need to be prepared to eat grass to actually stop this conflict. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really a telling uh, uh, statement because the price is 
between you know peace and between uh, I think was it uh, Dragger said uh, air conditioning. We we need to be made, able to make those hard decisions if we really are to ensure the institutions yeah. what is civil society succeed, uh, succeeds. And I think in, interestingly, what we're starting to see, I think, is is the the, the citizen, the individual, the, the consumer making those decisions, whether it's with regard to uh, to boycotts on Russia or whether it's people power with respect to, for example, the German government's position on on the continuing reliance on on as you gas in, in in particular. You know, I think those are those are, it's a really interesting um, reflection of where power lies, whether whether soft or hard power individuals and institutions. I mean, how how have the institutions responded? What does it say about uh, clearly the United Nations General Assembly, uh, the expulsion from the Human Rights Council, but but obviously a diff very different perspective in the Security Council. The Council of Europe has expelled uh, uh, Russia, um, but, but there are other, um, I think, cracks uh, emerging elsewhere. And you've talked about the challenges for NATO and, and for the European Union. I mean, how have the institutions responded, do you think? Well, I, I think that's probably one of the remarkable upsides on this is the cohesion in the context of the institutions. The expul expulsion, while it might be symbolic uh, from the Human Rights Council, is of importance. Uh, I think the cohesion in terms of NATO is extraordinary. In, in much of my time on the military committee, it was racked by um, friction, uh, dr largely driven by the US, who had a sense that Europe was free riding on mm -hmm. the US's investment in uh, in defence. And um, it was continually putting it up to uh, Europe to pay for its own um, defence requirements. And I think in, in 2016, the, um, the Council decision actually pointed towards that on the, the, the desire for Europe to be able to uh, act with strategic autonomy unilaterally uh, when necessary, but in partnership when possible. And, and, and that was uh, five years ago, six years ago. And I think subsequently Burrell um, made the point about uh, 18 months ago, the alarm bells are ringing. So the, the alarm bells were ringing uh, and the vulnerability of um, the European Union uh, was there for all to see. And it's going back to that point you raised earlier on, we probably had miscalculated on the actual attractiveness of economic interdependency and had, mm -hmm. had not actually paid enough attention to um, security. Uh, the other piece that was happening all of, while this was happening was the, the pivot uh, towards Asia uh, in the case of the US because of the, the growing strength of China. And, and that, to some degree, gave a vacuum in which uh, Russia felt it had an opportunity to act. And um, that's a book you gave me, uh, Ursula. Remember Robert Kagan's the, the Jungle Goes Back? He makes a point mm -hmm. in there. For Russia doesn't need to get stronger. All it needs to do is make Europe look weaker. Yeah. But if anything, what has happened here is Europe has mm -hmm. been strong. And uh, there has been an extraordinary sol you know, solidarity, I think, in terms of its response. NATO has been stronger, extraordinary solidarity. And also, I think, very measured in the context of trying to avoid that tripwire that could yeah. bring us into a, a more difficult um, conflict. And, and that's, you know, there's a, everybody has a view in terms of what NATO needs to do and what Europe needs to do. But it is really, um, it is really something that I think requires nerves of steel in terms of not causing that, that point that forces this into a broader conflict. And at the same time, we have to be sensitive to the very point of the violation of human rights that's happening in uh, yeah. Ukraine. And, and I do wonder about, the. We, we'll talk a little bit more later on about, about the role of individual leaders and leadership, but I, I you know, was struck by Jens Stoltenberg as somebody who has, has vast experience in international diplomacy, somebody who grew up with world leaders around his breakfast table, uh, you know, with, with, with uh, a household um, filled with, with um, senior politicians and so on. And you, you wonder um, how much those um, those experiences play out in people's lives later on in, in the leadership roles they end up um, that they end up in or that they're appointed to. So I think there's a really interesting question there about how individual leaders are so important at, at times like this and what makes them the formative leaders that they that they are. Um, one of the things that's really striking um, and that's come out in some of the questions that we have received in advance of, of this evening's conversation is how um, the extent to which the war is playing out in real time 
the instant communication, the almost hourly reporting of, of investigative and other journalists on the ground in Ukraine, um, nightly video messages from, uh, from, um, from Zelensky himself, uh, speaking into national parliaments, it seems almost, almost uh, every few days into the Security Council, an extraordinary um, opportunity for us to be the witness to what is happening in Ukraine. Um, the role of the media has clearly been key and is key both to our witness to um, the, the horrors of, of war in Ukraine, um, but also on the other side, the disinformation um, from Putin. And um, not just in the context of this war, but obviously interference in, in elections previously and, and so on. I mean, what are we learning about the role of media generally, but, but specifically in, in these times of, of, of conflict? Well, I think you're touching a very good point there, and I, and I don't think it's something we really have got our head around yet. And it's really a phenomenon of the last kind of 10 to 15 years, this, this inversion of power, whereby uh, social media and uh, connectivity has allowed everybody to actually have access to almost real-time information. The, the challenge, however, is, is how that information or those data are uh, used. And uh, we've seen in the past, and uh, Karen mentioned on the introduction, the, the, the role of the Defence Forces during COVID. And I remember at one stage early in the COVID um, response, uh, reading on social media how um, the, the army were going to be on the streets and martial law was about to be implemented. Mm. And I, I remember ringing Paul Reed and I said, Paul, are, 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 is there another institution at, at play here? You know, where is this coming from? Because it, it really showed how fake news uh, can actually gather a momentum and almost become viral. And, and the reality, that's what was happening. And the only response I remember at the time was to put out a, a tweet myself to say, check your sources, um, you know, to just go to reliable sources. But then that's a judgment call as what is a reliable source. But coming back to the inversion of power, I think what is quite um, remarkable is the, the, the data coming and the quality of the reporting is informing uh, not just uh, the institutions, but the citizen. And um, there's no doubt what we have seen uh, in the context of that uh, brave reporting uh, would seem to, and I'm going to be cautious here because there has to be process, but would seem to amount to a uh, possibility of war crimes uh, in terms of their totality, the, the real probability of crimes against humanity and a possibility of the most grievous of all, the crime of genocide. And, and um, the reason I say uh, we have to be careful here, because this is where uh, social media and the inversion of power becomes dangerous, is that you can very quickly have this kangaroo court uh, and trial by media, trial by social media. And when we fall down or slip down that slippy slope, all of a sudden we're, we're actually the ones that are actually um, creating a void between ourselves and what are the fundamentals of the institutions of civil society. And that's proper process. And uh, using what are there in terms of international institutions or our own national institutions to ensure that um, there is due process in the context of critical decisions that are made. And you know, more recently, we've seen some evidence ourselves in terms of, uh, if you like, Golfgate and others, whereby very quickly, you know, decisions are brought to a conclusion without process. And, you know, right or wrong, I, I think we have to be very careful uh, in the context of what is a civil society, what is the price of safe, living in a civil society where people are free, where the institutions of state function, and that's critical, and where the vulnerable are protected. But the institutions of state functioning has a price with it, and that means an adherence to be civilized in the context of how uh, we use data and media that are available to us. So that's that's the the, the uh, contradiction in many ways. If if mm -hmm. I've rambled on too much, I'm sorry, but it's something I'm I'm quite sensitive to myself in the context of how this inversion of power has often empowered um, lots of different types of community, homophobes, others who actually can be quite toxic in terms of their their discussions. And I'm not too sure if we've seen the end of this yet in the context of how we bring that into uh, the, the proper institutions of a civil society so we're more sophisticated rather than having the occasional evidence of kangaroo courts. And there is that, that um, relationship, as you say, between 
uh, between between um, media um, information, um, government governance, accountability, and and leadership, and the impact that it can have on all of those things. Um, to have, as you say, um, a proactive and and sometimes um, malign force in within within the media, within within social media in particular, um, and um, interestingly, to see the extent to which. Um, resourcing of of the big media houses needs to be now invested in um, investigative reporting uh, and um, you know all, all of those um, uh, responsibilities been taken uh, incredibly seriously, but but very within a very challenging context. And I think it's uh, the other side of this. Going back to Ukraine is of course the level of accountability, the, the chances of accountability, um, um, and the need to to very carefully pick our way through what is going to be. A, a painstaking and long process um, of of, um, of accountability and and we hope justice um, for those who have lost uh, lives and loved ones um, in in the, um, in the in the current situation. Um, well, I couldn't agree more with you, and I think the, there is a risk here between barbaric and being bar bar barbaric ourselves in terms of um, throwing the rule book out the window uh, in a rush to judgment. And I do think that. Um, there is going to ha take time for the institutions to consider what's been set before them and uh, there will be process. And at the same time, the political piece has to play too. And the political piece is, I think uh, Clausford said, you know, war is uh, the continuation of politics by another means. Um, Sun Tzu said that um, you must uh, create a golden bridge from which to retreat. Now, the, the challenge here is to get, uh, I suppose, out of this mess, there, there has to be politics to play. And, and that will give us a very, I think, challenging scenario at a future point, the sooner the better, but at a future point. It's a real risk for Zelensky. It's a real risk uh, for Putin. But I, I, you know, at the end of the day, I think there's going to be a piece on the politics side that's going to bring us to a point mm -hmm. of truth. And at the same time, that doesn't mean that the institutions don't take their journey, which might be quite torturous in terms of coming to a point of truth. But that's what it is to be civilized. And that's yeah. what uh, we need to be able to to ride those two horses in the context of the politics will come to a point whereby Zelensky may well have to sell to his citizens a, a, a settlement that is suboptimal. But at the end of the day, it means bringing to an end the, the massive loss of life mm -hmm. uh, pro tem. And at the same time, he then needs to rely on the institutions to address, you know, the perversity of what has been happening. Yeah. Can I can I turn to another um, really important subject? It seems um, inconceivable that it's only a few months since we had uh, COP26 in, in Glasgow, uh, November 2021, um, the, the climate uh, crisis. Um, and um, as was being, being repeatedly seen sidelined, um, uh, by COVID-19 and now by the war in, in Ukraine, when it's clearly the existential issue of our time. So, you know, that that challenge of, of what we can learn from one crisis to another to, to galvanise into action, why do you think the world has been galvanised into sort of collective action in response to uh, the war in Ukraine and, and, and arguably also in response to, to COVID-19, although there are some questions about that, obviously, in relation to the vaccination program and so on. But why, why have we reacted so um, singularly and, and um, strongly with regard to those issues when we have really failed to do so with regard to the climate crisis? Yeah, I, I think one of the penalties of democracy is the political cycle of five years. And, you know, in the context of sustainability, and I, I think in my own research, you know, decisions that actually are built on sustainability, they're not one decade or two decades. They have to be looking at a timeline that is eight, nine, maybe even a century almost. And, however, there's, there isn't a political dividend in terms of a, a government in power that actually is making decisions now that actually the dividend won't be reaped uh, for another 50, 60 or 70 years. So there is a there is a proximity of crisis that actually uh, forces a political response. And in terms of COVID and in terms of Ukraine, the proximity was here and now. But uh, going back to Kagan, he, he made a very good point about often when we pour over 
a real, real challenge. How did this come to pass? And the answer often is slowly, then suddenly. The, 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 the difficulty with climate crisis is it's slowly, but it, it, there's no doubt the suddenly is coming. And um, this is why I think um, we, 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 we have to um, be prepared to actually um, just think about our uh, next generation, think about our grandchildren in the context of the, the manner in which we have um, uh, had the luxury of utilizing resources like there's no tomorrow. Well, there is a tomorrow. And, and we have been living unsustainably um, uh, over the last uh, 50 or 60 years in particular. We've been consuming resources as if um, it, there is limitless resources. We have been uh, destroying ecosystems as if they can regenerate quickly. In terms of my own expertise, in terms of uh, sustainability, in terms of fisheries and uh, biodiversity in the maritime, it's just extraordinary, the actual recklessness that has been there. In, in one of the areas I, I researched, in, in particular vulnerable marine ecosystems like cold water corals, it can take 4,000 years for one of those reefs to form. They can be destroyed by a deep water trawl in 30 seconds and and by the way the, the the protein that's caught like an orange roughy which by the way has been fished off the west coast those those fish some of them the individual fish were swimming when uh, darwin was on the beagle theorizing about the evolution of mankind these fish lived to over 200 years and and what happened in that side was a perversity in that the amount of fish caught uh, flooded the market the, the price collapsed and the fish were turned into fish meal to feed cattle. So these are the kinds of um, decisions that have brought us to this point. But I am I am more an optimist than a pessimist. I think the outcome in terms of having 1.5 degrees on the agenda in, in the context of what we need to strive for. I, you know, the government's plan in terms of Ireland of five gigawatts in terms of offshore renewable energy by 2030 and 30 gigawatts and more for the enduring re regime after that is ambitious. But actually, it can be a lot more ambitious. There is a huge opportunity for a, a new green industrial revolution around the development side in terms of offshore uh, wind and wave, uh, but also in the context of the, the intelligence side in terms of using this development to actually have biodiversity net gain in terms of stimulation of uh, biodiversity regrowth, the use of um, some of these offshore uh, developments to actually farm uh, seaweed or kelp, or even the stimulation of seagrass, which is one of the most uh, carbon absorbing, uh, I suppose, biodiversity ecosystems that is on the planet. It is in the region as successful as the rainforests of South America. Mm -hmm. and, and then parallel to that, and this is what the most recent IPCC has pointed towards, mm -hmm. was the issue of carbon capture. Did this mm -hmm. capacity, this technology exists and I think the marriage between offshore renewable energy producing the electrons, the use of those electrons then to electrify transport and electrify a lot of our systems, the use of the surplus then to drive carbon capture technologies or the creation of green hydrogen and ammonia to give a new e-fuels for aircraft, it is all going in the right direction. And there's no doubt about it, the technology exists. The difficulty, however, do the institutions exist to be able to pull this together? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about sustainability, you know, in, in the, and that should be a norm. It should be a norm in which we're willing to actually punish ourselves for not being sustainable. We need also to look at the principle and the norm of integration because that's where the challenge is. And irrespective of what kind of institutions we have, uh, what kind of uh, autocracies or democracies, we're all on the dock together on this. And it is going to require integration between all types of um, systems to bring us to a point of truth to actually keep us below that 1.5 degrees every decimal of a degree counts and one of the really interesting things about about the uh, the climate crisis has been the role of of young advocates of young people speaking out um holding uh, adults and and the world globally to account um with their particular perspective i mean you talked earlier on about, about the, the Russian perspective on and, and, and the risks of, of sidelining or marginalizing or, or, or ghettoizing those who, who, who we need to, to reach out and to, to, to um, be part of the, of the, the, the future um, 
future discussions on these issues. But you know, when when you look at the perspective of a young person to whom twenty fifty is is their uh, is is the middle of their life. To us, it's it's the end. I think there's a really stark reminder of of the impact on our children and grandchildren of our failure to grapple with these issues. Um, whether it's from a exactly. governmental point of view or from an individual point of view, and it seems an extraordinary price that we're willing to pay. Well, that's the point, Ursula, and I think you've hit the nail on the head. We need to look beyond our selfish selves, and we all have uh, children and grandchildren. That's that's really the, the, the greed part, whereby that's the piece whereby if we just can't get our heads around it, you know, mm. we're actually ourselves um, living in cuckoo land. We need to actually look at our responsibility. And, I, and you often look at it in terms of what is society about, but it's about regeneration in terms of the, the species. And if if we can't rationalize that ourselves, we're more stupid than uh, we, we think we are. So we, we, we really need to, I think, join those dots that it's 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 all very well for us to uh, be resistant on some of the decisions we're going to have to uh, embrace. But we, we can't afford to do that if we consider our children mm -hmm. and our grandchildren. And that's, and, that's I think, when the, 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 the dots really join up, when you actually take that, that point of view in terms of your own family and your grandchildren. And, I mean, the, the question was asked, uh, you know, what, what, um, what we, we actually, how we can better communicate what sustainability means. You know, what does it really mean? And how do we really help people understand? It's one of the areas where you mentioned the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the sixth report. We're, we've got a huge amount of, of verified scientific data now, and yet this question of how accessible we make the concept of sustainability seems really important. Um, and I wonder whether the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals adopted in, in 20. 2015 with with targets and so on to be met by, by 2030 i wonder whether that is the the real value of the sdgs they try to communicate uh, in an accessible way the interconnected nature of all of these issues whether it's climate or poverty um, whether it's justice um, or rights these are um, really key um, priorities uh, that, the, that the world a global community has signed up to and that can mean something within the context of research and education science policy and so on is that is that, is that how you see them because i think there there are different views about the value of the sdgs yeah well i think first of all in terms of sustainability and i i think um john kerry uses the um the the idea of a uh, internalizing externalities and and that sounds like a mouthful but for me, that means that you actually understand that any decisions you make, that you're you're taking the complete price into your consideration. Like going back to my cold water corals, to catch that that species, there was no value on the cold water corals because they didn't figure in the, in the calculus. But the reality is, the cold water corals were the very reason the fish were there in the first place, and also the cold water corals were were a carbon sink. So, you know, total economic valuation would actually have you uh, obliged to start looking at the, 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 the total costs of your actions. And likewise, in the context of the, the way we actually consume resources, that we would look at the total price around that. And there are hard questions for us in the context of, for instance, on the amount of protein we, we consume. We are consuming too much protein at the moment. The, the, the human being and the amount of animals, whether it be chicken or cattle or whatever, actually is, is creating too much carbon as it stands. So there's a decision there whereby we can start making decisions ourselves to actually um, be more uh, sustainable in terms of our own outlook. Mm -hmm. Going back to the Sustainable Development Goals, I, I think it's a remarkable uh, achievement. And Ireland led that with Kenya back in 2015 in terms mm -hmm. of qualification of those goals and for me it, it's a framework it's it's a higher level framework that and and I, I i see a strong linkage between those goals and between values and i often use the phrase of nested governance whereby the framework that's provided by the sdgs allows us then in a nested manner whether it's at state level because we we must embrace those goals or right down to organizational level whereby we actually capture the goals in the context of how we craft the values of the organization that we're involved in and and values are about action they're not about 
uh, statements that are on the wall. They're, they're about action in the context of how we action those values and how we action those values then is, is about uh, an accountability. And at its simplest form, you know, the ability of an organization to actually have evidence that it is actioning the values that it has embraced, right back up at the state level, that the state in terms of embracing the SDGs, that its national action plan is codified in a manner whereby its actions against the various goals are, are actually uh, subject to performance indicators to show that the evidence is there, that you're not just talking about them, but you are actioning them. And so I think it's a remarkable piece of work and the mm -hmm. SDGs are as good as it gets in the context of, going back to my earlier point about integration, this is not about a siloed approach. It's about the integration and the totality of this orchestra that needs to be in as much as possible in harmony. And I and I and I would completely agree with you on the integration and approach and the value-based approach and the extent to which it has has um, been been quite um, I suppose been been uh, grasped by states at a policy level. We're doing really interesting work here at, at UCC around the mapping of our research onto the SDGs and really, the I suppose that that's that's the real value of them. They can be. Um, they can be embedded into our activity, into our priorities, and from a policy research and so on perspective. I suppose my my concern would be that we don't regress to an approach that is more charitable or discretionary than the human rights model, which uh, is the one which, weak as it may be, nonetheless has, has teeth, has enforcement mechanisms, has uh, strict and well-established monitoring mechanisms. So the relationship between human rights law, I think, and the SDGs is still one which, which certainly um, scholars in my, in my field and in others are, are grappling with and, and working to. So I think um, one of the really interesting things about them, though, is to, to bring us on to uh, the whole area of, of leadership is the, is the role of soft power um, you know, the value of soft power comes through the SDGs, I think. And um, and that's not to say that it's without without um, significance. So how do we maximize the potential of soft power um, when um, when the challenges are so great? Yeah, well, I, I think um, Ireland has an extraordinary role in that regard. And, and I think it's it hasn't um, it hasn't been found wanting in, in endeavoring to come to the fore in areas like human rights, in areas such as dealing with difficult areas like uh, cluster munitions and uh, and the actual uh, codification of principles, um, and also in terms of the nuclear arms side. And also going back even in terms of Law of the Sea Convention, uh, in terms of the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention, the marginers as they were known, it's it's um, it's that extraordinary reputation that Ireland has in its capacity to actually, uh, I suppose, punch well above its weight because of that credibility. But it's it, coming back to the SDGs and in terms of climate change and its most recent, um, or it's 18 months now nearly, it, 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 the decision for it to sit on the Security Council, that was mm -hmm. built on a recognition of Ireland's um, I suppose transparency, but it's also bona fides in terms of soft power. A country that actually was it, it, its its values were forged in a furnace of famine and migration, a, a, a furnace of oppression, and that credibility and its ability to actually then leverage that in the context of trying to do good. You know, you might recall the discussions with regards to uh, why why is Ireland trying to spend so much money to be on the Security Council. Well, you know, the, the reality is that's about leadership and it's about bringing uh, your contribution to um, what is the, the most sophisticated institution um, that uh, the world has crafted. It's not perfect. We know that. And I think there is going to be real reflection uh, after the, the perversity we've seen in the, na in the last six or seven weeks with regards to the functioning of that institution. But that being said, it is still an institution that we have all got behind. And, and soft power should never be underestimated in the context of its capacity to bring that collective to a point of truth. Mm -hmm. um, the, the point I would say is perfection is the enemy of the good here. Mm -hmm. and, and often our desire to have perfection uh, means that you know perhaps suboptimal outcomes are, are the good uh, that could be achieved quite quickly are, are, are set aside in this desire to go for perfection. Mm -hmm. so, 
countries like Ireland, I, I think, are masters at actually pulling the collective to a point of truth. That often is what we need to be doing rather than reflecting on trying to get to a point of perfection that is unattainable. Mm. And to, to, to speak about, about leadership, to pick up that point on, on leadership um, as we move to, to a close, Mark, I know uh, your own um, uh, interest in leadership is very, very strong. And I think we both share this understanding um, of the capacity of, of, uh, of good leaders to do exceptional things, whether individually or in, as part of institutions, and, and, and yet recognize and have experienced some of the challenges of that. I mean, we've seen some great uh, leaders in, in recent times. Uh, Mary Robinson, our, our fellow um, Mayo um, uh, person, and Angela Merkel, obviously, and, and now uh, Vladimir Zelensky um, emerging as, as a, certainly the right um, man at the right moment. So who, who do you think are, are some of the great leaders in, uh, of our time, in, in your view? Well, well I, I'm going to embarrass you now because actually, I, and I didn't say this to you before, or maybe I did say it to you a number of years ago, one of the best leaders that influenced me as a youngster was your grandfather, Bob Kilkelly. And I remember in, in a club, the Ramblers Club, and I, I was voted in as chairman. I was only 13 years of age. <laughs> but, but your grandfather was, you know, a, a mentor to that club. And I always remember, you know, saying, you know, I shouldn't be doing this. Um, but actually, it, 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 was, it was really in hindsight following on a philosophy of um, Mary Parker Follett, who was a, a, a US philosopher back in the 1920s. And she said, leadership is not about the exercise of power, but rather about the capacity to create that sense of power in those who, who are led. The real role of a leader is to create more leaders. And, and when, you, when, you, when you capture that and reflect on that, so much comes out of it, in that the leader who is creating more leaders actually is shown humility in that it's not about them. It's about enabling and uh, other leaders to blossom and to actually grow and to realize their full potential. And, you know, Mary Robinson is an extraordinary leader and her resilience is extraordinary. And anybody who's in her company cannot but feel the absolute commitment she has to climate justice. And, and that's what we need. Uh, in in at this very time, her energy is 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 second to none. Um, but there are so many other uh, leaders, and I, I often think in terms of um, our own graduate from our alumni in terms of UCC, the likes of Joanne Reardon, or, or Reardon in, in terms of her own capacity to actually make a difference in 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 the circles that she moves, and to be almost be inspirational to us all. On the sports field, we have the likes of Jim Gavin. And maybe if Jim Gavin wasn't there, we might have had uh, Sam in Mayo uh, before <laughs> now. But, but uh, that's it. But I mean, like, like the reality is, you know, in, in the context of the leaders that we see, um, I think the most dangerous thing of all is to start worshipping a leader, you know, from the point of view of this type of leader or that type of leader. We all have a role to be a leader and to do our best in the context of to make a difference. And, and it's one of the, the points I always ask whenever i talk to people is what 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 difference can you make what is your unique piece that you can make in terms of a contribution because if we go back to where we've all come from whether it's that field in kenya a quarter of a million years ago or the homo nalidi that was fifty thousand years before that we were barbaric then today mm. we're much more sophisticated and the institutions that underpin the way we live uh, those institutions of a civil society are, are absolutely critical, but they only succeed whereby people are reflective and are always looking at how we can enhance the um, civil society in which we, and we, we live in. And, and yet we, we struggle. Um, we struggle to support uh, diversity in, in our leadership. We, we, we struggle uh, to, um, to, to ensure that we have a sufficient um, capacity and leadership there's there's a reluctance often to uh to put your head above the parapet to 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 as you say be be a leader however um people may view that that challenge i think it's it's um it's still a challenge that we don't um uh, we haven't really really grasped the level of of diversity in in uh in certainly informal leadership roles and i speak in particular i suppose of my my own experience in 
uh, from a gender perspective, um, it's a real challenge. Um, and I think the the equality, diversity, inclusion agenda was never more important, and it's particularly important in the context of leaders that you can see and be. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, and I'm delighted that SDG five, Goal Five is there in terms of uh, the empowerment of women and girls. Like in my own experience, and I, and I, I have got beaten up on this in the past in terms of the advocacy on gender equality and empowerment of women. You know, Ireland sometimes thinks it's got it sorted. Actually, we're we're pretty much kind of. I won't say we're laggard, but we're halfway down the field in terms of our European colleagues. And when I look at it internationally, one of the strongest indicators of, of interstate and intrastate violence is gender gap. It remains to this day. So, so from the point of view of actually uh, moving forward, we've, we've a good bit to go. And I, I, on the issue of diversity and inclusion, like it was tragic to see that story in the, in, in the press this morning of the homophobic attack that happened mm -hmm. In Ireland, and once again, we we commend ourselves for being so progressive in terms of diversity and inclusion. But there is still a very strong cohort of homophobes and toxic masculinity there that exists in the context of society, and and a view in many quarters that um, this this you know idea of diversity, inclusion, and gender equality is 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 not an appropriate institutional way to move forward. So the, the leadership side in terms of the advocacy means that we have to stand up and actually drive those agendas and ensure that they are institutionalized. And those who actually have the, the audacity to call them out, they, they are called out and mm. challenge and stand up to them because they do exist there in sometimes very strong places. I think that's, um, I think that's an important um, I suppose, challenge and priority for the university. And I want, want to finish with some thoughts on, on the role of the university in, in EDI, um, but also in, in the range of issues that we've touched on, uh, the promotion of human rights, the promotion of the, the SDGs, advancing uh, through our, our, um, our sanctuary status, uh, our commitment to, um, to social justice, um, Certainly, um, the, the the university's track record and sustainability is 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 excellent, and it and it is committed to um, a, um, a, a, a this as a real priority, both for its research and, and a teaching agenda, but also as as an organisation. Um, and and I and I think it's really interesting to see then uh, the business school taking on sustainable leadership as as its as its mission. I think it's great that the. The Center for Law and the Environment, which you know is, is running its conference again this year on the 5th of May. So these are uh, really important contributions that the um, that the university, the research, the scientific um, community can can make um, in in the context of the the contemporary challenges we've been discussing. But what I think what what else I suppose should the university be doing? How can we take uh, this conversation forward? How can the university? Do more, and how should it respond to these global challenges? To to develop leaders in in these areas, to um, to support and and nurture students to become the leaders that the that the world needs in these and, and other other challenges. Well, well, I I think this exercise we're engaged in here is an example of how you show leadership, and you you take these uh, items out and you discuss them and you pass them, and you you push, um, you know, I suppose some of the challenges are there. But also in terms of what is required, and I, I, I know in terms of development, your own strategy, the actual embracing of the SDGs, but also the actioning of the SDGs, and be discerning in terms of how you capture the performance indicators around progress against the SDGs that best match against um, the university strategy. Similarly, like you know, the relationship between um, UCC and IMI, for instance, and this is an area as you know well your own leadership in the context of accepting this strand around ESG and the whole issue of mm -hmm. looking at sustainability as a, a leadership piece that we need all to become more immersed in. Uh, and, and I think that's that's um, there's just remarkable opportunity in the context of this space for, um, for policy, uh, for uh, discerning on the law, for looking at the technology in the context of what's happening in areas like um, Marai and others, to uh, other areas, to actually have that marriage between how you develop the institutional relationships to leverage the technological opportunity that is there, because it, it needs to be hand in glove. 
But I, I do say the risk, however, is always going to be on the institutional side because that's about people and people are awkward and trying to get your your people into a point of truth you know, in a very complex piece. It goes back to, was it Weber who wrote about uh, wicked problems in the 70s relating to, to um, planning law? You know, there, there are black swans there. Uh, I even, we know with the likes of Brexit, which was a black elephant, I also <laughs> say there are black rabbits there because when they mix together, they, they spurn out new wicked problems that can be very difficult. And we can wring our hands and step back and say, oh, we can't do anything about it. And that's to abdicate. Actually, you know, the requirement is you just need to roll your sleeves up further and try and develop that marriage. And and I suppose if coming towards a close in that, it is that marriage between science and the social sciences, whereby you bring the two together because it is you need to have the policy chapeau for good technological data to land. Uh, all the science in the world that doesn't land within a framework that's going to act upon it is as much use as a hole in the head, unfortunately. And and I, I think that's the that's the real sophisticated piece is to bring those um, two disciplines together in 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 conferences, uh, but also in programs where there is interdisciplinary research uh, that actually allows for the diverse perspectives. And that's the reason I'm coming back to the point on diversity. While I'm a real tra you know advocate for diversity and inclusion, it's just extraordinary in my experience. You know when you have diverse perspectives, you know in a room. Um, that you you find these extraordinary outcomes of this almost disruptive innovation that comes from bringing those diverse perspectives and that can be in terms of gender it can be in terms of culture creed sexual orientation but it also can be in terms of discipline i remember one of the first things i did when i became chief of defense was to bring my team down to the central bank to meet the governor and his team and i remember you know some of uh, my team were scratching their heads and what are we doing down here but actually, very quickly, the discussion landed on the issue of risk. We were in the business in the military of management of risk. The governor and the central bank team were in the same business. And we had a really, really fruitful discussion about how did we miss the indicators of the 2008 crash? You know, because that's the risk in terms of military point of view. You're watching to see the indicators of the next threat to your security. Yeah, and that's the wonderful thing about the university environment allows allows that creativity and those conversations to take place across disciplines and and perspectives. And it's it's really uh, such a rich um, opportunity for uh, for creating those different different um, ideas as they as they germinate and develop and and, and take take hold. And um, Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Um, this evening. Um, a huge thank you to you for participating in our Global Speaker Series and I look forward to more conversations like this with you over, over time. Um, I'm going to thank you all for listening. It's been great to have you all with us and I hope you enjoyed our conversation and I'm going to hand back now to my colleague Karen Kelly. Ursula, thank you and it's been a pleasure to work with institutions like UCC uh, because you do give that leadership to provide that diversity of views and disciplines to come together uh, in, in fora that allows for open, transparent engagement. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Mark and Ursula, thank you very much for a very informative discussion tonight and for sharing your insights on some of the um, crises the world is facing at the moment and the global responses to those. Um, thank you also to everyone who joined us for tonight's discussion. Um, we hope that we'll be able to have some in-person events again soon. So we'll be in touch with you about those. And thanks again, Mark and Ursula, wishing everyone a nice evening. Thank you.